My name is Eric Owens, and I, am the, I have the honor of serving as the chair of the AAR's Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion, which, among other things, serves as the jury for the Martin Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Marty Forum. We gather today to honor Jacob Olopona, the 23rd winner of this prestigious annual award and the first scholar of African religions to receive it. Named for the distinguished historian of American religion who was its first recipient in 1996, the Martin Marty Award recognizes extraordinary contributions to the public understanding of religion by individuals whose work has a relevance and eloquence that speaks not just to scholars, but to other publics as well. Relevant contributions may involve work with any number of specific publics, including but not limited to educators, government officials, print or broadcast media, museums, nonprofit and non-governmental organizations, and more, and can be through any medium, books, films, articles, television, public address, community organizing. Jacob Olopona is professor of African religious traditions and professor of African and African American studies at Harvard University. He's the author of five books on Nigerian and African religious traditions, including the magisterial City of 201 Gods, Ile Ife in Time, Space, and Imagination, as well as the prize-winning monograph, Kingship, Religion and Rituals in Nigerian Community, a phenomenological study of Ando Yoruba festivals, and more recently, African religions, a very short introduction. His research ranges across African spirituality and ritual practices in detailing religious pluralism in Africa and African diaspora communities in the Americas, including the understudied reverse missionaries from Africa who have come to the United States to establish churches. He's also well known and widely admired as a mentor to generations of Nigerian and American students, many of whom are now accomplished scholars in their own right and many present in this room today. Born in 1951 in Ondo State, Nigeria, Olopona had an early exposure to the dynamic character of religion as a son of an Anglican clergyman whose denomination's entanglement in Nigerian colonial history provided the initial impetus for interrogating the nature of religion-state relationship in the country. What began as a passing curiosity for a young mind would later become a major academic preoccupation and a lifelong professional engagement. He majored in religious studies for his bachelor's degree at the University of Nigeria in Nsukka, and after a year of compulsory participation in the National Youth Service Corps, he joined the academic staff of the University of Ife, renamed Obafemi Owolomo University in 1976. Apologies for mispronunciations. He thereafter proceeded to Boston University where he obtained his PhD in comparative religion in 1983. While his scholarship is largely focused on African religions, he has brought into this field a theoretical and methodological sophistication that is distinctive for both its breadth and its depth. Beginning with his first book on kingship and religion in Ondo, his work has continued to shape the study of African religions, not only correcting earlier misrepresentations of these traditions, but also highlighting their global developments and public relevance. In recent years, these latter aspects have been at the heart of Olopona's scholarship, his pioneering study of African immigrant religious communities in the U.S. have helped to move the study of African religions from the margin to the center of scholarly conversations in this country and beyond. The traffic of religious ideas and movements between Africa and the West is, of course, never unidirectional, and he demonstrates this reciprocal interaction between the Western and African publics in his current project on African evangelical evangelicalism. And in addition to this vast and seminal scholarly work and expanding understanding of the diversity and complexity of African religions, he's also known for his work for peace and understanding in Nigerian civic, academic, religious, and political spheres. And he was a winner of the prestigious National Order of Merit, Nigeria's highest honor for intellectual accomplishment in science, medicine, engineering, or technology, or the humanities. For this important work and much more, the AAR's Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion is delighted to honor Jacob Olapona with the 2018 Martin Marty Award. Professor Olapona's distinguished interlocutor for the Marty Forum today is John Campbell the Ralph Bunch Senior Fellow for Africa Policy Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. From 1975 to 2007, 
Ambassador Campbell served as Foreign Service Officer in the U.S. Department of State. He, he served overseas in France, Switzerland, and South Africa, and twice in Nigeria, first as political counselor from 1988 to 1990, then as U.S. Ambassador from 2004 to 2007. He also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Resources, Dean of the Foreign Service Institute School of Language Studies, and Director of the Office of UN Political Affairs. Ambassador Campbell is the author of Morning in South Africa, at Nigeria, also Nigeria, Dancing on the Brink, and most recently, Nigeria, What Everyone Needs to Know. He received his BA and MA from, in History from the University of Virginia, and a PhD in 17th century English history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to his career in foreign service, he taught British and French history at Mary Baldwin College in Staunton, Virginia. Ambassador Campbell is uniquely positioned to join Professor Olapona in a conversation that will bridge continents, professions, and scholarly disciplines, always with an eye on the ways in which religions and publics come together. And I look forward to your conversation today. Thank you very much for that most generous introduction. Uh, unlike you, I'm not a scholar. I'm a policy person. Uh, my concern is to assist U.S. policy makers in their diplomacy, and that includes identifying what they need to know and the issues they have to be concerned about. And from where I stand, one of the most important countries to our future is Nigeria. One bumper sticker to get us started off. The UN estimates that by 2050, Nigeria's population will be 450 million people, and Nigeria will have displaced the United States as the third largest country by population in the world. Nigeria really matters. It's also an extraordinarily difficult country for we Americans to understand. And that's why I am so grateful to Professor Jacob Olupona for the work he has done over really almost a generation. Uh, it is absolutely where we must begin if we are going to move beyond cartoonish images, both of Nigeria, but also of Africa. Professor Olopona, Nigerians will often say that they are the most religious people in the world and the happiest. Do you agree? Uh, I quite agree with you. Uh, <laughs> it's not just a perception. Uh, I think it is a reality. And we have seen that in different contexts. We know fully well that religion is a complex phenomenon. But somehow, we uh, can say that in every way, Nigerians are religious, and they have expressed it, both in their personal uh, lives, in their public lives, in the way they relate to uh, uh, people, to outsiders, and so on and so forth. Um, what is very interesting about it, and why people often raise this question, is that they are aware that Nigerians are very, very optimistic about life, mm -hmm. and they face serious issues and concerns. And yet, in this context, they express their religiosity, they express their happiness, and people really don't know what is going on here. Mm -hmm. um, we yeah. often, uh, you see, we often associate uh, religion with uh, sort of those old Western constructs that well, people are religious, uh, it is because they lack certain things. We give it functional meaning and interpretation, uh, political, social, economic uh, uh, dimensions of it. Uh, well, we now know that religion is like a double-edged sword. It has both functional and dysfunctional elements. What religion has done for Nigeria is to keep them going, is to give them you know, hope in the face of problems 
and issues that are very, 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 very uh, are serious. Uh, I often express this at times in the uh, Christian uh, uh, metaphor, even though I walk in the valleys of death, I shall fear no evil. Uh, and this is real. However, it's also important for us to recognize one thing, that those who often raise this issue, raise it in the context of Islam and Christianity, but we need to move beyond that. Their whole cosmology, their worldviews and everything, it are all defined by the indigenous religion. We constantly react to it. Look, if I sleep at night and, and, and kind of have a, a bad dream and wake up, I'll be worried about it. As a professor of religion, it doesn't stop me from you know, thinking critically about what has just happened to me. Mm -hmm. And what is the solution? I turn to my faith. And you know fully well, we are both of us are Anglicans. And I was raised in a very, very interesting uh, 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 family. Both my grandparents are evangelical Christians. And by the way, I think I told you I'm writing about it right now. And what, of course, in raising us, we were made to believe that you have enough resources to deal with the issues of life. In terms of your identity, your religion is there to foster that. And, and, and it's also the case that Religion uh, uh, is not just a church business, a, a place you go to uh, on Sundays and, and you come back and that is it, as it's done in the West. It's an everyday issue. From Sunday back to Sunday, they're constantly there. And of course, through that, they have been able to become more optimistic about life. Issues that would have destroyed certain countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, have failed in Nigeria. So this would be my take on that. And of course, uh, 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 because I also mentioned that our primary worldview is defined by that indigenous religion, somehow, even when they, have pro they profess to be Christians and Muslims, they are constantly asking the questions that relate to their own worldview, that indigenous traditions, and responding to it, of course, using the resources of Islam and Christianity. We Americans, when we look at religion in Nigeria at all, tend to see it uh, or put it in a context of rivalry or even conflict between Islam and Christianity. Uh, I deal with this all the time uh, in Washington where the media will present some outburst of violence in, say, the middle belt of Nigeria as the result of Christianity's rivalry with Islam. Professor, what do you say when people say that to you? I um, respond by simply uh, urging us, both scholars and practitioners and uh, common people, to take history seriously. Mm -hmm. History is important. I was born before independence. I was born in 1951. This was not the case. So when I had the opportunity to give uh, I, an address, something that like an ina inaugural address, after I was awarded the Nigerian uh, Order of Merit, I decided to deal with this. And I titled my talk, Bonds, B-O-N-D-S, boundaries and bondage of faith. And I showed how in our history, we began with a, a, a in pre-independence a, a, a period, we had a society and a culture where people bonded. I will not forget a situation in 1962 or so when a Muslim in the town where I was raised went to Hajj and came back I wanted to give a Thanksgiving service in the church, in my father's church. Because other members of the, of the family and the lineage were members of the Anglican church in this particular town. And then, of course, we were made to uh, learn a song. I was a little boy. I was in a choir. So I came home singing this thing. And my mother thought he was hearing some strange things <laughs> and asked me to bring my you know, notebook and called my father to come and hear what is happening in his church. You know, and then that was the beginning of a real history. Because, of course, 
the community believed in that unity that was talked about. So religion, as we all know, scholars of religion, as we really gathered, the bonding of people, that was in place. Gradually, Nigeria moved to a second stage, where boundaries were constructed between traditions and faith traditions. And we now move to a third stage that has made religion to become almost like a kind of a bondage. I showed that clearly in my presentation. So those who are dealing with Nigerian problems must you know, recognize that. The second thing has to do with the fact that the elite, particularly the political elite, are constantly invoking religion for their own, for their own selfish ends. And if we don't recognize that, then that would be a problem. But it is real that there is serious conflict between Christians and Muslims. The way we handle it, the way we understand it, and the way we procure solutions to how to move Nigeria forward is a real issue that we have to deal with. It, totally, it relates to the questions of constructions of identity. A nation building project is a constant project. There's no end to it. Even in America here, the nation building project is still on. Absolutely. You know, we're in a different phase of it in contemporary America. So, but if we have leaders who do not understand even the basics of nation building, we are in trouble. And let me be very clear, I am not referring to a particular religious government, I mean, a, a political government or whatever. This has been our story from the beginning. Unfortunately, there was a time when we found ourselves under the military and it was in, in there. And I will show you one, uh, let me give you one example to illustrate for that at this point. You see, during the time of General Gowan, Attempts were made to create institutions, you know, uh, such as the National Youth Service Corps. I had discussed that under my work on civil religion. Mm -hmm. The National Youth Service Corps was like a rite of passage, a national rite of passage. And those of you familiar with rites of passage, like in the, in the eighth grade system in the villages and the town, you will see the similarity in that. You come, you finish your first degree, you come together uh, uh, as coppers, and then you bond, you learn the language, and you begin to see yourself as Nigerians. That was the, in fact, I will say that that was the most important program created by the government, you know. Of course, we know fully well that our intellectuals were responsible for suggesting and creating these symbols that I talked about. I did that very successfully. Mm -hmm. Several years after that, I visited the same place, and what I saw was disturbing to me. I then found out that they were already grouping along religious and ethnic lines. I started hearing Coppers Christian Association, Coppers Pharmacies, uh, this thing. And I said, what is going on here? It's, the, it's exactly the anti communitas experience that they're supposed to have in this nation building project. But what was most unfortunate to me was that when I brought up the, the issue, even among colleagues, they didn't know what I was talking about. And I try that to be as simple as possible. That you, the experiment you created, you are destroying that. Now, what is going on in Nigeria is that a lot of people are saying that they should even face out the National Youth Service Corps program. It's of no use to anybody. Why is this so? So those of us who are convinced that we have to do something about our situation must understand this history and must be willing to deal with it because, of course, we know what to do if we are given the chance to pay, play active part in it. Before we move beyond a discussion of Christianity and Islam in Nigeria, one of the things that's always intrigued me is that in southwestern Nigeria, the area around Lagos, dominated by the Yoruba people, there are Christians and Muslims quite commonly in the same family. They intermarry with each other. They keep each other's holidays so that, and they, they fast uh, as well. Uh, uh, they fast during Lent. Uh, President uh, Obasanjo, a born again Baptist Yoruba, has a sister who is a Muslim. President Obasanjo uh, always followed the Muslim fast. How is this so? Why is Yoruba land so different 
from elsewhere. <laughs> also, Yoruba land is big. The Yoruba are one of the three largest ethnic groups in the country. We're not talking small. Uh, very, thank you, Ambassador. That's a very interesting question. Uh, even before General Obasanjo, we had the Chief Awolowo. Mm -hmm. Yes, before that, who was the leader of the Yorubas. We know fully well that Awolo was a sister, was a Muslim, and Awolo was sponsored her to do the Hajj. That's, it's in the textbook. Uh, religion primarily doesn't define Yoruba identity. Religion cut across lineage, family, identity, so, so to say. And again, it has to do with history. Islam came to Yoruba land almost uh, probably three, four centuries before Christianity. Yes. And of course, met indigenous religion there. And then there is a, 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 an Ifa text that says, Aye la Bafa, Aye la Bamali, Osangagani, Ibabode. We met uh, Ifa, well, indigenous tradition in the world. Uh, and we met Islam, quote unquote. It's a reference to that history. And all of a sudden, Christianity came. It's a reference to the missionary Christian, you know, thing, to join that. We never did alter these words. They want to reaffirm the primacy of what you have just said. The idea that we all belong to the same lineage, we share the same blood, we are not going to be divided by our own religion. My father, who was a priest, the mother came from a town called Owo. Who we were born in the village, I mean the village called Ute. Mm -hmm. Members of my, my grandmother's family are oh, Muslim. They're from a Muslim family. Uh, in Djibouti, where we had at least a great, a great Anglican priest called Udutola, who in fact was a Muslim, then became a Christian. Members of you know of his family also uh, uh, remain uh, uh, Muslims. Mm -hmm. So that has not uh, be, that's not been the case. Um, as a result of that, Southwest has this responsibility in the context of Nigerian politics and history to remain faithful to this tradition, to recognize that they cannot allow these new realities of uh, religious division to, to, to divide them. And, and I think one of my friends in the North uh, once said that Southwest is going to be the saving grace of Nigeria when it comes to religion. If it happens that South Red now is divided along religious lines, particularly Islam and Christianity, then we must recognize that we are in big trouble in Nigeria. So this is the, this is the truth of, of, of uh, I think, what uh, you have referred to. Um, however, I must warn that this reality and this truth is gradually changing. We are now seeing, we are, we are seeing lots of problems in this same southwest that, uh, Yoruba uh, area, and we have to be very careful about it. This, I'm afraid, is very true. When I first lived in Lagos in uh, the late 1980s, people would wear each other's ethnic dress because they liked the style. It was rather like Scots people wearing each other's plaids. That seems to me to have largely disappeared. When I have put this question to Yoruba friends, they have said to me, oh, what really matters is we all worship the Yoruba gods. <laughs> and by that, what they are referring to is Yoruba tradition. Yes. That Yoruba tradition is more important than uh, allegiance to a particular religion, all of which, of course, comes from outside of Nigeria. That's Both true. Islam and Christianity are foreign religions. That is true. Which leads us to indigenous religion, mm. about which you have done work that is celebrated. What can you, how can you frame the ongoing importance of indigenous religion in Nigeria? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's not just in Nigeria, mm. across the continent, Africa, and the whole world, but our focus on Nigeria, as I've mentioned that. I was born in my mother's hometown called Okegbu. 
and I was born as a twin, Ibeji. Mm -hmm. And of course, the tradition was very solid at that time. My grandparents recognized that this child must be raised as a twin, as a, as a Beji. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mentioned earlier on that they, also, they were also evangelical Christians. So I was exposed to that. So my identity, so to say, at the beginning was shaped by this exposure to the Christian tradition in the, town, in the, in the, in the house where I was born and the tradition of being a twin in Yoruba tradition. And I recognized that and grew up as such. I had the opportunity and the privilege to uh, travel with my father to many places where he was a priest. And I wrote a book in you know, his memory um, to celebrate him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After that, I went to the University of Nigeria in Suka in the eastern part of the country after the Civil War, where I did my first degree. I didn't stay in the Yoruba area. And I say to you, I was celebrated there. I was a member of the Students' Union uh, Executive. I, I didn't even know I was going to graduate because I was just busy playing student politics. <laughs> but there, there, quite a number of teachers that taught me, even though they were Christians, they saw the merit in this tradition. People will argue that our worldviews are defined by indigenous tradition, but we have become Christians and Muslims. I started looking into that and discovered that uh, in spite of all the conversion, I cannot say they did a bad job, that we are missing something in there. We are missing something that would have defined our lives and our society. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the reason why Africa is in trouble today. It's not even just a question of conversion. Yeah, you can convert to Islam and Christianity, but your inability to take seriously the epistemology, the knowledge that these traditions give us is a serious crisis. It is the reason why we cannot deal with issues of violence, why we can't deal with issues of health, why we cannot even deal. I mean, take herbal medicine. The Chinese are busy doing their own thing. You travel to China, you go to a pharmacist shop, they will ask you, do you want Western medicine or do you want traditional medicine? Both of them are there in the same pharmacy shop. So the question is that, why were we made to throw our own sources of knowledge away? Why were we made to discountenance the importance of these herbs that would have helped us to build our society? We know fully well that we have failed in different ways. The health, these resources are not there. We at times don't have the money to buy the most sophisticated web, I mean, uh, instruments to put in the hospitals. We are struggling to deal with that. Yep. And yet what is close to us, what we have, uh, uh, that can help us even deal with basic problems or basic uh, uh, illnesses, uh, malaria and whatever, we have failed to do that because of certain forms of orthodoxy in Islam and missionary Christianity that ask us to discountenance every aspect of the culture, including the knowledge that our forefathers gave us. This was one of the reasons that led me to that. In addition to that, the violence, the violence that these traditions, that the missionaries and the Muslims have done to indigenous tradition, I believe we need to stop it. I am not against conversion. My father, like I said, I used to tease my late father. I, I call him a missionary. Uh, you know, he knew I was not going to be a priest. He would have loved that, you know, uh, they ordained me as an Anglican priest. Uh, but he knew that, that I was not going to be there uh, to do that. So it is this quest for knowledge. The idea that there's something missing. The idea that we have lost a lot and that we need to bring this back, recognize it, for the purpose of doing what or to secure our future in the world. This is my this is this is this is this is what has led me to this. And it's not just within Nigeria itself. You, uh, I'm sure um, you know uh, my colleagues are aware of 
the role we played in forming the indigenous uh, religious tradition study group in the academy mm -hmm. that allows other indigenous tribal practices like Native American uh, to come together, Australian Aborigines, to come and have a kind of a conversation relating to our status in the world. The way we are placed in the global understanding of religion, the idea that some people have created the term world religions and the rest of us are not under this. We are not regarded as world religions. What does that mean? Of course, it's a lie. It is not true. So there is a form of activism that we cannot but be, uh, uh, be engaged in, in restoring the dignity, the legal tone, and the identity of Africans through their belief systems. So by indigenous religion, you are referring to traditional wisdom, traditional insights into how people behave and how they can get along with each other, and that by throwing it out, uh, Africans and others are essentially depriving themselves of a means to build the state to come closer together. Do I have that right? You, you got it right. You got it right. Uh, I gave the example of health earlier on. We can come to the questions of governance and peaceful coexistence and cite lots of examples. Uh, there is a text in Ifa Divination uh, that talks about uh, a, a quarrel that was caused by one man called Mr. Uh, uh, called, uh, Kankan. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the time uh, one of our mentors, uh, Professor Bimbola, uh, recited this very interesting Ifa text about how Mr. Kankan, Kankan, by the way, that's Mr. By Force, began to cause trouble all over the world, moving from place to place. When there is peace, it will, be, it will take trouble there. And then if I predicted what will happen to Mr. Kankan, uh, there are lots of references to that. How, you know, if I and other traditions have dealt with issues of violence, how they have dealt with issues of governance, issues of justice. Uh, 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 let me give one more example about that. And I remember when we were young and we were in the Sunday schools, we were made to act those, uh, um, uh, those uh, uh, passages or events in the Bible. Uh, one was uh, King Solomon's judgment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most of you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were going to do King Solomon's judgment, uh, the, 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 the teacher you know, gave us different roles. And appointed priests and gave chiefs, I mean, uh, gave chiefs and gave them chieftains the titles. In the act of King Solomon, deciding on that case, he did it the African way. King Solomon didn't just come to say, hey, you know what, uh, you, uh, 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 woman A, you lied. That child doesn't belong to you. Or go and cut the child into two, and, and then you, you know that whole story. You're an Anglican. What he did was that all those classmates of mine who were chiefs, we are made to comment on the case. Chief Loduba, what do you think about this case? Chief Loduba will say, we should cut off the head of the mad woman. Chief uh, Lisa, what do you think about this case? Uh, uh, my, uh, my, my Highness, <laughs> uh, I think this was, and then after that, King Solomon gave his judgment. The Yorubas who call this, uh, yes, Niweri, Agba uh, Niweri, in the sense that the, 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 the judgment that Solomon was going to give was already given by his chiefs. So that is a clear example of how governance and even African systems of justice is played out. So we were made to understand that. We were, even though we were acting an, a, 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 a text in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we did it the African way. So we are not talking about people even going back to Orisha tradition. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is how we are going to allow these this practices, this moral system, 
this epistemology to inform our lives, our culture, and our society today so that we can you know, uh, uh, do better than you know, uh, what we're experiencing today. And let me give you one more example to, to, to also illustrate my point. To understand why this is a critical issue. The system of uh, uh, taking oath of office in Nigeria and in most African countries. You are given the Quran, if you're a Muslim. You are given the Bible, and then you stand before the uh, a Supreme Court judge or so, and then you take this oath of office. One of you that you will not embezzle money. You will be faithful to the federal government of Nigeria, and all will be well. The truth of the matter is that we, should, we have not asked ourselves, in spite of all this oath taken, why are they still embezzling our money? Does it mean that they do not even believe in the scripture? We have recommended that they should give people symbols of indigenous tradition. Give them the symbols of Ogun, and let us see what will happen. They will run away because they know that if they swear take the oath and they go and see they steal, they will die. Because, because unlike Islam and Christianity, that suspends judgment till the other world. <laughs> the judgment of traditional religion is here, is here and now. And in fact, uh, 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 one of my, uh, uh, one of my, my uh, consultants, Babarawo, once told me, he asked me the question, Professor, why do Christians and Muslims spend all their time wanting to be around room? They want to be citizens of heaven. They want to be around room, literally. Mm -hmm. they are, we are all working to be citizens of heaven, right? Whether you are Muslim or Christian. He said, we traditionalists, we fight hard to be citizens of this world before we become citizens of heaven. Very insightful comment. Very true. Yeah. Now, Probably the greatest contemporary enemy of traditional religion in Nigeria at present is the movement called Boko Haram, the, the group that we Americans regard as essentially a terrorist organization, in all probability with links to Al-Qaeda or with the Islamic State. I'm not saying what is, I'm saying what the perception is. And it is extremely hostile to any traditional religion or the, the infusion of traditional religion into Islam. And in fact, it regards the practice of traditional religion by Muslims as apostasy, and apostasy deserves death. And hence, there have been far more Muslim victims of Boko Haram than Christian. How do we fit this into the larger context? I suppose it should also be said that they are viscerally hostile to the Nigerian state. They regard things like the Nigerian flag, the oath of allegiance, the national anthem, as essentially placing the state in place of God, and therefore it must be destroyed. How do we incorporate what is in fact probably a fairly large number of people who at least acquiesce to that particular approach? It's a problem of uh, nation building. It's a serious crisis. And it has deep root in the Nigerian uh, context. Uh, it is true that uh, Boko Haram will not be the first. We had movements such as Maitasini uh, uh, earlier, also coming from that same part of the country. Uh, there's always been Islamic uh, resurgency in our history. Uh, and mainly in northern part of uh, Nigeria. But what uh, has sort of not been too clear to us is that number one, 
Some of these groups, particularly Boko Haram, they are invaded in some kinds of mysteries, as if yes. they are not clear, you know. Yes, very much so. To the extent that even when it started and people were talking about the origin of Boko Haram, we were not even clear of what was going on. Mm -hmm. That's right. And instead of the state to face the problem, they were busy apportioning blames. One party accusing the other of being the source of Boko Haram. But, you know, as a student of history again, I, I, I want to make sure I refer to what I said earlier on. During the 1990 Constitution debate, when Muslims walked out of Yes. The, the assembly. And President Obasa Joe had to come to beg, mm -hmm. uh, beg them in the name of God to come back. We must not forget that the focus was on what? No Sharia, no Nigeria. If responsible politicians and state men and women are bold enough to say that, they have already told us and the populace that Nigerian constitution, at least in that context, doesn't really matter. That's right. That religion really trumps, trumps yeah. the nation. So we have all contributed to this problem. Uh, there are a number of people, they are, uh, the difference between them and Boko Haram is that they are not carrying guns to shoot at their fellow right. men and women. So we have to go back to the basics and ask ourselves, have we agreed to remain one as Nigeria? Do we want to live in peace as a nation? I'm, I'm tired of the kinds of, uh, the kinds of, of almost constant crisis evolving and, you know, to the extent that it's even difficult to say that people live in peace at times. So we need to really uh, uh, deal with it. I traveled to Maiduguri this last summer mm -hmm. uh, to greet uh, one of my friends there, and I seized the opportunity to visit the University of Maiduguri. I was very impressed with them when I learned that they had not allowed Boko Haram to disturb their lives. They know there is danger out there, but they keep working and holding their classes and doing their work. I was very impressed. Uh, and, and I remember when I came back and asked some friends that I was in Maiduguri, they said, you went to Maiduguri? Uh, I thought to say you were going to Abuja. I said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you where I was going. Uh, you would have, I know you would have discouraged me from going. So Nigerians are also, uh, they're trying. There are quite a number of Nigerians, they do not like what is happening. They're trying to find solutions to this problem. Yeah. But that leads us to an observation that the political class in Nigeria is not as, as good as, as devoted to Nigeria, as devoted to the establishment of a good society as the people of Nigeria. Yeah. How do we account for that? Um. I will begin with the, an advice I give a new pro-chancellor of a Nigerian university uh, who was appointed to come and be the chairman of the council. Mm -hmm. uh, he called and said, wanted some advice that, you know, he understands I'm pretty savvy about this thing. And I said to him, you need to make up your mind about one issue. Are you there for money, or you're there for fame, or to save your name and leave a good name. You cannot have both. This is part of the problem. Until we have state men and women who are willing to say this, that it's better to leave a good name behind after I've done my work, than to leave a bad name, but to be fiddly rich which means embezzling public funds and so on. Or if we, don't, if we don't get to that stage where we have leaders mm -hmm. who will say that we have come to politics not to enrich ourselves, but to build this nation, 
in different ways. Whether you are a local government a chairman, or you are a state governor, or you are you know, the president of a nation. The situation has reached a state whereby it's very difficult for an ordinary Nigerian to believe that uh, 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 the politicians are serving their own interests. They find it very hard. Particularly when we begin to hear about uh, embezzlement of money and money missing and so on. And yet there are honest and lovely Nigerians who really believe in this experiment, who really want it to work. And he will do everything humanly possible to make the sacrifice that is required. The other part of it is that, and this relates to what I said about nation building. You know, anytime I, I kind of recognize a hero or I recognize someone who has done very well in the Nigerian, uh, uh, Nigerian uh, affairs, either as a military officer or as a state person and so on, and notice that they're never celebrated because they're not noisemakers. And even when they die, instead of the nation to, to establish something in their memory so that that becomes part of our history and examples for others and the younger ones to see and say, oh, this sacrifice has not been in vain. I want to be like this man. I want to be like this woman. Until we begin to do that. In other words, nation building project, like I said, is an ongoing project and there are different ways of doing that. You can do it through symbols. We can do it, but if the symbols are pretty empty, you are insisting that they sing the national anthem. You are insisting that they you salute the flag. You are insisting that they do their own part of it. And your own, you know, what you should contribute to it, or to make that happen, to enhance that, you have failed to do, then you're not going to solve the problem. It's very striking when you're an outsider living in Nigeria the absence of national heroes. They're ethnic heroes, but not national heroes. Finally, before I turn this session over to you, would you tell us a bit about what you're working on now? Well, I've just finished a, a draft of a manuscript <clears throat> on uh, what I call evangelical Christianity in Nigeria. And it's an attempt to go back to my roots, to begin from there. Uh, as I said, my, my grandparents were evangelicals. And trace that history from that time to the contemporary period where Pentecostal charismatic churches are uh, invoked. And to argue that indeed the tendency for uh, uh, churches and denominations today to become Pentecostal, they are acting it. And yet we know they are not Pentecostal. As scholars, we need to explain that. So my argument is that while all Pentecostals or charismatic Pentecostals are evangelicals, not all evangelicals are Pentecostals. So I'm, I've traced that whole mm -hmm. phenomenon and discussed it in different, different contexts. I think uh, uh, once I'm through with that, I, I'm, I'm taking a look at the Nigerian situation, particularly the area, area of education. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do. There is a need for us to, uh, again, continue to train these young scholars, pre and postdoc, so that they can uh, begin to do the kinds of things we used to do in the 80s. I'm always happy and proud any time I come to American Academy of Region meetings like this, because I, I kind of see the students I trained mm -hmm. as undergraduates at IFE. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm happy about that. They have become professors. Uh, some of them are greater than us in you know, prestige and honor, uh, which, is, which for me is it's, it's worth um, uh, uh, celebrating. So I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that whole route. Uh, part of it is also that we have a sense of guilt. Uh, uh, we keep asking ourselves, why did we leave Nigeria at the time we left Nigeria? <laughs> uh, there's still a lot of work to do. What can we still do? Uh, we're not going to allow these little disturbances to uh, blow that vision. That is what I'm doing. And I hope uh, my friends and colleagues will join me, and some of the people who are listening to me too have already joined us, to make sure that we bring back the old glories. We bring back the time when professors were honored in our, in our history. Look, there was a time when 
Uh, the head of state will not take any decision about anything without, you know, calling the, uh, uh, the, the professor at the University of Ibadan or, or University of Lagos or Amadou Bello University to say, tell us about this. We want to do this. What do you think about it? And the advice and suggestions we are taking seriously, that is gone. How do we bring it back? This is what, this is my objective at this stage. Work well worth doing. Now we are in the extremely fortunate position of being able to continue a conversation with Professor Olupona. You will notice that there is a microphone in the middle of each aisle. Would you please come forward to the microphone and pose your questions or make your comments? And if you could also introduce yourselves, that would be very, very nice. Uh, my name is uh, Elochuku Uzuku. I teach uh, theology in uh, Duquesne University. And uh, Professor Olupuna, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I was a few minutes late. It wasn't my fault. It was uh, the fault of Eshu. When <laughs> <laughs> <through. laughs> who encountered me at the crossroads and misdirected me. So we should blame it on Eshu, Eshu Le. Uh, I was at the Parliament of World Religions uh, in Toronto and uh, uh, was privileged at least to have a conversation with Wanda Abimbola. I know that Wanda Abimbola, uh, you studied under him, I imagine, at Ife. And I didn't even know that you studied in Nsoka, but I thought it was Ife that you, you worked in. And uh, he was all the time outraged where in the circles where we are discussing precisely Nigeria and the dialogue of religions. There are at least two sessions. In one of the sessions, uh, Pastor Bakare from Gombe State with Omnia Group, they have set up discussion groups I didn't even know it existed uh, between uh, Muslims and Christians in, uh, and uh, indigenous religious practitioners. I want to uh, 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 you know, note what Abimbola was saying and which tallies with what you said earlier. Uh, why do you talk so much about the dialogue between Muslims and Christians? Where is indigenous religion? Pastor Bakare replied immediately that they made the mistake initially of having a conversation in Gombe only with Christians and Muslims, but they realized that they should include the leaders who are indigenous religious practitioners. I was um, enthused, I mean, I, I was happy about that. So oh, I'm happy to hear that you went to Medugri, I wouldn't dare. But uh, congratulations that went to Meduguri. Is there such a thing going on in Meduguri? A conversation between indigenous religious practitioners and Muslims and Christians to reestablish peace in, uh, in, in that region? That's yeah. just a question. Okay. Shall I? Uh, thank you. Um, very, very interesting questions. We need to recognize that this was not the case in the past. The triple heritage, as we call it, uh, the time uh, our, our, uh, our leader and teacher, Ali Masuri, uh, created, was very much alive in Nigeria. In the 60s, the dialogue of civilizations and dialogue of uh, traditions included indigenous religion. And it continued for a while, until certainly the tension between Christian, uh, Christians and Muslims escalated. And part of the tension focused on the idea that we do not want to sit down to talk to pagans. And on this issue, both Christians and Muslims agreed. So you need to understand that. They both agreed that, you know, oh, yeah, 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 well, they should not be part of it. And I'll give you one example to, 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 to tell you how wrong they have been. The last assignment I have at UC Davis in 2006 before I joined Harvard was to take a group of people, of scholars, to Nigeria, to Ibadan, to talk about how through interfaith dialogue we could uh, 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 respond to the issues of HIV AIDS. 
So we picked a number of uh, uh, practitioners, Muslims and Christians, and we also got uh, traditionalists, diviners. So the first problem I had to deal with was to convince Muslims and Christians to please sit down with the traditionalists. They said, oh my God, oh, a, a war. But somehow I kind of used my limited uh, <laughs> knowledge and influence to persuade them to please at least sit down. We, invited so, we also invited some medical doctors as consultants. Mm. You know what happened after that? The most interesting information about HIV AIDS were given by the Babalawos, the diviners. By the end of the dialogue of this conversation, we had achieved our objectives. The Babaladura, the Christians, and the Afars, and the Muslims started talking to the Babalawos, getting their telephone numbers. They wanted to hear more. The medical doctors told us, oh, we are going to the villages to talk to these people. We changed the system. My own approach to interfaith dialogue is not to be talking about doctrines or whatever. It's to talk about different projects. How can we come together to, 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 to act on development issues, health matters, questions of governance? I have a feeling if that they are able to come together to work together, they will root out the bad politicians. There will be a reason for coming together. But when they gather to talk about faith and this thing and so on, it's always a problem. And by the way, uh, if you don't mind, let me correct that whole notion of issue causing your problem. <laughs> I don't think issue was responsible for your missing the way. <laughs> uh, uh, and of course, the issue you are talking about is not the issue we know in indigenous religion. The issue you are talking about is the one that um, you know some of these Christians and uh, uh, Christians and Muslims. Um, uh, our fathers have created to uh, find a way of demonizing indigenous tradition. Uh, an issue in Yoruba tradition is seen as the, as the, as the, as the joy of the city. Olailu is seen as the, the one that brings a, 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 a peace and dialogue to the people. So uh, I'm training scholars uh, everywhere now, uh, particularly my students at Harvard, to begin to change this mindset so that we can, as a nation and as a continent, you know, move forward. Thank you. More questions? Thank you very much, Professor Proponent, Ambassador. Um, you made the point that um, the African religion is not included as one of the world religions. Mm. You are an icon. You are at Harvard University. Is it possible for you to support the initiative, the movement that can eventually correct this mistake? Probably American Academy of Religion can help give you some help and all of us so that the textbooks we use, I am, I didn't introduce myself, Jude Agor, Professor of World Religions at Mercy College, New York. Uh, Is it possible to get some initiative going to correct this? That's my first question. My second question is this. Um, you've done monumental work. You've uh, had so many students in our study. You have done such great deal of work. But the question now is, is it possible to translate all this academic work to the grassroots in such a way that if, if we have any hope of reversing the trend uh, that eventually the traditional religion is, indigenous religion is going to evaporate completely, is there any way we can translate all this academic effort in, in, into the, once again reinvigorating 
um, what happens in our society back home? How, how could that be really done? Huh. <laughs> the, the first question, we're already doing that. You don't forget that uh, years ago we held a conference uh, at the University of uh, California Davis that led to that book called Beyond Primitivism, Indigenous Religious Traditions and Modernity. And the conference we had later on in Miami that led to the production of the book, The Global Yoruba Religion, uh, was to put a stamp on that, where we brought scholars and practitioners from Brazil, from Cuba, from Africa to come together to recognize that. The conference we had at Harvard on Ifa Divination that led to that book, Ifa published by Indiana Press, performed that same you know, uh, 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 role. And I must say to you that today, if you go to the booth and check on some of the books on world religions, most likely you'll find indigenous religion discussed. In fact, in some cases, they will discuss African religion, Native American religion, and so on and so forth. That's them. But in addition to that, I think it's also important to recognize forms of world religions, like Christianity and Islam, that do take seriously indigenous tenets and epistemology in their, the way they approach um, uh, the subject. Uh, and I think that's also very important because they have the academy has recognized, and you may not believe this, that the kinds of epistemology, the kinds of issues, the themes that we are raising and discussing in indigenous traditions are so central to the so-called world religions and they are gradually I mean, incorporating them into what they, they, uh, uh, what they write and what they do in the classroom. Uh, it's now known to everybody that uh, we can't limit the study of religion to textual tradition. We have to talk about rituals. We have to talk about performances. We have to talk about uh, arts. We have to talk about, uh, I mean, different kinds of different, uh, categories and themes that are coming out of our understanding of indigenous religion. So the changes are made, we are seeing that. Uh, we can only, I mean, we shall only continue to put more effort into that. But I think this is really happening. The second question is a more difficult one because of this conversion to Islam and Christianity. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that there are now, uh, maybe you are aware of it, uh, movements that are you know, coming up that are trying as much as possible to return to Africa, to return to Nigeria, to begin to emphasize the importance of this tradition, particularly in the way we interpret, interpret them. Uh, we depend uh, a lot on the roles of the kings, the others, you know, the obese and the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the leaders in various uh, 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 communities. But we are seeing some changes. At times, uh, they're very quiet. For example, we know fully well that in Ocean State, they have declared a day, as it says, a day, a day of holiday for indigenous tradition. There are some of our students who are here, uh, uh, Funlayo, uh, who spoke in one of the um, panels yesterday, uh, who talked about what she's doing to, you know, a, a, to make this thing happen. And, and we are seeing that. If uh, Oshobo, all these cities are bombarded, people who come from the diaspora, uh, travel to Brazil, oh my God. I was there, you know, for the conference uh, organized by one of, uh, one of our fellows here a few, uh, few, a few, a few uh, uh, weeks ago, and there were close to 54 books that I saw on the table on Candoble, Ubanda religion. I was just staring at them because I don't speak Portuguese, you know, but I recognize that these books are about Yoruba Orisha tradition. So we are we getting that. It is slow. Um, it, it, but I think it's important for the state to recognize that by not encouraging the practice of indigenous religion, that they are doing the nation a total disservice. But we understand why. Part of the problem is that they are conflicting the practice with occultism. You know, uh, there's a kind of a ritual killing there. They say, oh, the Babalawus have come again. There's something going on there. You say, see what indigenous, that's occultism. And by the way, let me also remind you, 
that the reason why there are courts now among our youth in Nigerian universities is precisely because of this. The youth that are coming out who did not see what we saw, who didn't grow up seeing the practice of indigenous religion, but imagining what it is, are trying to create it and bringing it to the universities, wanting to, you know, or, uh, to, to perform forms of sacrifices. They are engaged in all kinds of practices that we know are not good for the society. It's a response to how we have handled indigenous religion in Nigeria. We have time for one more question. Uh, okay. Prof, I want to thank you very much, uh, an ambassador for this uh, conversation. Uh, I have a comment and I have a question. My, comment, my question will come first, then my comment, uh, maybe we assist in answering the question. Prof, don't you think we have a constitutional problem? Especially because we're talking about secularism, section 10 of our constitution. But the reality in this conversation has shown that it is all about religion. What can we do to bring religion back into that section 10 and eliminate secularism so that we can face our realities? That is my question. Now, the issue of uh, indigenous uh, religion engaging in the conversation among the tripartite religion in Nigeria goes beyond the issue of uh, uh, history. It is also about the fact that some leaders, the political elite, are benefiting from this disconnection among the three religions. And that is why it is easy to demonize African indigenous religion. And uh, I mean, you, you, you stand to correct the first uh, respondent from the floor here, that you don't have to do this, uh, what uh, Flyer yesterday said is a translation of violence, of saying that the issue is a devil. I am not devil. I mean, in my school, because I teach indigenous religion, they call me a shoe. And every time I go with that stigma, the stigmatization alone drives many of us into hiding. And we don't want to do this religious activism that is expected in the public domain. What is your reaction? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Relating to the first question of uh, secularism uh, or the secular state, Nigeria is not the only country in the world that declares itself to be secular. Uh, America is a secular state, and yet religion is practiced here. Why do we now use that as an excuse for uh, acting for, uh, asking for what, uh, things that are totally impossible? Things that we know would destroy the nation state. The issue is not even about that. I understand the constitutional thing you're talking about. Even if they bring it back to the constitution and clearly declare that Nigeria is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and this thing, it is not going to solve the problem. It's the intention of the leaders. We must, as Nigerians, agree that Nigeria has come to stay. And that Nigeria, as a nation, as a nation state, trumps religion, be it Islam, Christianity, or in traditional religion. We must hold that, that this is our commitment to this nation. And there are going to be issues. There are issues in America today. But Americans have the faith that this is just a passing phase. It will pass, and the nation will remain. That commitment is what I have not seen. And it has to, you know, it must begin with our leaders. This is the root of our problem. Until we have leaders who are truthful enough and faithful to the, the commitment that they have made, that they want to serve this nation and they serve the nation in truth and in justice. Just, I mean, ask, asking high school students to be singing national anthem and reciting this thing, that they themselves know is empty. 
It's simply because those who are asking them to do it do not believe a thing in it. This is where we have to do that. I don't want to use the word revolution. But the kinds of revolution I'm talking about is not violence. It's not, we don't need a drum. We don't need a military back. But there must be cultural and social revolution in Nigeria so that we'll get to where we need to get to. We must all agree that we want the nation to remain. It's the pride of Africa. It's the pride of the black race. You know how many people stop me here to talk about Nigeria? If only we can get this thing right, this is the place to go. This is what we have to do. Again, I'll revert back to the ambassador that God's willing, we will get there. <laughs> You'll get there. That's the last word. Thank you very much. Second, we still have a minute or so. We're just one second. Okay. Sorry for the confusion. I'd like to make a couple quick announcements at the end, but also offer, we do have a few extra minutes to offer uh, a few final words from uh, Professor Olpona uh, as you like, and then I'll have a, an announcement or so before we wrap up our session. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. You know how much respect I have for you. Uh, we have been together for a while. I was quite surprised when they told me that you're going to be the uh, interlocutor. And I said, oh my God, Ambassador Campbell. Uh, but I, I, I know that you, you, you know what you're talking about. And we, we respect you as Nigerians. We appreciate what you have been doing and what you continue to do. So I want to say a big thank you for uh, engaging me in this uh, conversation. Uh, I thank um, Eric for chairing this uh, committee, and I thank members of the committee for considering me worthy of this, this award. Like I said to you, it came as a big surprise, uh, uh, but I, and I accept it uh, with humility. I dedicate it to my students, past and present, a number of them are here, dedicated to my, <laughs> to my teachers, Dedicated to my teachers, teachers who taught me in, in, uh, in high school, uh, undergraduates, you know, Nigeria, Suka, and uh, uh, you know, at Boston University where I did my doctorate. I, uh, I am blessed, there's no doubt about it, I know that. And I thank friends and colleagues who have been, who have always been there for me. They have always been there and I deeply, deeply appreciate, uh, uh, appreciate uh, your help and your assistance. I, uh, for me, it's a, it's a reason to rededicate myself and my life uh, to uh, doing more work for my nation, Nigeria, for America, my second home. Uh, as I often say, we are blessed to be here uh, and to you know, live our lives here. And I believe that uh, we, will, we will continue to, to, to strive. I please express my uh, thanks to the American Academy of Religion for this, this honor. I want to thank all of you for coming. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. I know how busy you are at this time. Um, the fact that you have made the time to come, for me, uh, is an in indication that you, you, you love me, and, and, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to add my thanks to Ambassador Campbell for making the trip here, especially for this. And, uh, and again, to say how honored we are to have uh, Professor Olapona among the roster of uh, re distinguished recipients of this terrific award. I think you've seen from our conversation today that the, the winners of this award are not simply technical experts who convey ideas to, a, to a, a general readership, but people who are invested in what the meaning of religions can, can be in our lives, uh, civic, moral, 
uh, academic and public, and who work for good and peace in the world as well. And we've seen this today, and uh, it's an honor to have you uh, to have you on the stage Thank with you. us. Thank you very much. Now, one last thing. Um, a few years ago, the Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion uh, began the practice of selecting the Martin Marty Award winner 12 to 18 months ahead of its uh, delivery at the annual meeting. And we did this in order to guarantee that the distinguished representatives who would receive the award, as well as the distinguished interlocutors who would take place, who would take part in this award would be available. These are busy people traveling all over the world to do the work that we're honoring them for. And, um, and not all of the winners of this award are members of the Academy uh, or regularly attend our meetings. And that's something that I think that most people aren't aware of yet. So we're trying to make sure we signal this to people that we're making our decisions a year or a year and a half in advance. Accordingly, our committee has already selected next year's award winner. And while we would usually wait till the summertime to announce that winner, uh, today we are doing something new by announcing next year's winner. So it is my pleasure to announce that the recipient of the 2019 Martin Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion will be Wade Clark Roof, Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies and founding director of the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a legend in the public understanding of religion, and he has been nominated many times over many years by many people who agree that he belongs among this distinguished roster that now includes Professor Olapona. Professor Roof will receive his award next November in San Diego. Nominations, including self-nominations for the future Martin Marty Awards are invited from every AAR member. They are due each year on January 25th, and using an online form at the AAR site and are compiled for review by the CPR, CPUR, our committee, at our annual spring meeting. Nominations are considered to be active for two award cycles. So we ask you to please send in your nominations for the 2020 award and the 2020 award, 2021 award to come. And I want to join both of our panelists here in thanking you all for spending this time with us this afternoon. And I wish you the very best the rest of the day.